Uh, so hello everyone and uh, welcome to the Canadian Friends of Peace Now webinar. This is the second in our new series. Uh, today we're very pleased to have with us Shaked Mareg and Brian Reeves from Peace Now in Israel. Today's discussion is titled From Settlements to Annexation. Shaked and Brian will be giving us their insights on the latest developments that impact prospects for peace between Israelis and Palestinians. We will start with some brief comments from each of our guests. And after that, I will kick off the Q&A sessions with a few questions. Uh, then we're gonna go to some questions from our audience. I wanna thank all of you very much for sending in uh, your questions in advance. There were some really good questions. I'm sure certainly going to incorporate many of them. And I invite all of you to write your questions at any time uh, during this webinar into the chat function. The chat function is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's an icon that says chat. Please click on that and it's going to open up a toolbar on the side of your screen. Into that, please type your question and our administrators will be reviewing those questions and pulling them into our Q&A. Um, okay, so um, I'd love to introduce our speakers now. Uh, Shaked Mareg has been the Executive Director of Peace Now since July of 2018. She came to Peace Now after having served in senior positions in the Merits Party, including as the party's Acting Secretary General. Previously, she served as the community coordinator for a grassroots Israeli Jewish Palestinian organization for social change. Brian Reeves is the director of external relations at Peace Now. He previously worked at the Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institute and as a visiting fellow at the Mitvim Institute in Israel. Shaked and Brian, welcome to you both. Who would like to kick off? Thank you. I'll start. First, I, I really uh, enjoy seeing so many people connected to this webinar. I want to greet you all for showing such an interest in our situation in these not so easy times of the Corona crisis. And uh, uh, we're really um, empowered knowing that we have um, allies um, across the seas, uh, overseas. And um, I'd maybe start with a short political intro. Uh, we are in Israel, uh, uh, the corona crisis found us. It's a very uh, fragile situation and political um, uh, time. We're after the year of uh, three elections in a row, in none of which there was a very a clear outcome uh, that, that made it possible to uh, form a government that is uh, agreed upon the majority in the parliament. And therefore we are under a um, interim government for uh, more than a year now, that is the same government that we had for the, more or less the same government that we had for the last decade, um, but now it's not uh, representing the majority in Israel anymore but is still in the power uh, position. And within that uh, last year, we've witnessed uh, major changes in the political arena in Israel regarding the situation of uh, uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, including the presentation of the deal of the century, so-called by Trump, and uh, um, which, which uh, uh, inserted the idea of annexation right into the mainstream of political discourse in Israel in a time where there is no um, uh, consensual leadership that can deal with this, this idea and, and take it forward or stop it uh, whatsoever. It's just been used by different uh, uh, political um, actors in order to promote themselves in different directions and we, Peace now, uh, see it as our challenge to to uh, explain to the Israeli public and to the uh, leadership the risks and the big hazard that the annexation poses. Um, I maybe will elaborate later about the the different uh, risks about annexation and why it's so bad to the Israeli interest. But what we see at the moment is that after uh, as I said, a decade of a right-wing government, including the last uh, four or five even last years, uh, which, uh, in which the government was the most pro-settler than ever before, 
in which there was no uh, uh, such uh, change. Uh, I mean, even under the most right-wing extremist government, there was no annexation legislated. And now uh, they try to form a unity government with the Likud and Blue and White Party because none of which got enough support to form its own government. And they, say, they, they tell us, the people, that the time is uh, emergency time because of the uh, corona crisis. But then they insert annexation like you put a pill in a, in a dog's bonzo. They just <laughs> insert it into the entire coalitional um, negotiation as if it was something that just had to be there, uh, although we know that it was not promoted for a very long time. And uh, 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 this time uh, is maybe the worst time to, to deal with such a challenge uh, when we know that we are facing a, a historical uh, crisis in terms of, of uh, economy and uh, public health. Um, so this is the, the ironical si situation that we're having here. It's kind of um, uh, the, the shock doctrine uh, is being uh, used in a very clear way uh, in order to change the, the rules of the game. They use the fact that the people are under ongoing trauma. And uh, in this very challenging time, we try to, to be the ones that uh, uh, lead the public shout against this uh, dangerous uh, step. Yeah, just to add on to that, um, as Shaked mentioned, because of the Trump plan, annexation is on the table more than ever. Um, what that basically means is there's, there's really three options that the government has if it's going to move forward on annexation. Um, one is the first is to uh, try to annex something that's within the Israeli consensus, at least on the Israeli side, what people believe would be part um, of Israel no matter what. That's Malay Adumim, a uh, major settlement near Jerusalem, or Gush Sion, a cluster of settlements near Israel. Um, the second idea would be to annex more, a larger swath of the West Bank, like the Jordan Valley, which you might've heard of. And then the third would be to annex all of the settlements. And that's really what the Trump plan envisions. Um, in terms of what would be, let's say, a worst case scenario, uh, now clearly annexing all the settlements, that would be the worst case scenario. You would annex and the Palestinian uh, population would sort of be in these sort of Indian reservations or, or cantons without actual uh, sovereignty. But in fact, it also might be just as bad if Israel was to do any of the others, the, you know, annexing just a small part of, uh, you know, a, a consensual uh, settlement. Um, mm -hmm. It might be easier to do so because the public might not be against it um, because it's so small. Um, so it, it, you know, it, oftentimes Netanyahu will uh, present the worst case scenario and then he will take away some of the more odious elements of the plans that he's promoting. Um, but also the idea of annexing something like the Jordan Valley, a large swath of the West Bank, um, you know, this is something that, you know, might get pushed back from the public, but without properly, uh, a properly informed public, if we fail to do our jobs and don't inform the public, then there's actually a real chance that he might able, even be able to go through with this um, while Trump is still in office. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, so you, 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 you touched on a, a phased approach to annexation. Um, is that the interpretation of how you and various others are looking at what might happen? Or is that actually something that the government or Benjamin Netanyahu is actually being proposing? Uh, it, it, it hasn't been proposed, um, and it's, it's, not, it's perhaps an interpretation that you want to go small, because the, the idea is here is, is annexing anything. That's the, the watershed moment. Uh, you know, there was, there was recently a, uh, an ad in the newspaper here featuring uh, over 50 MKs, and they say annexation, that would be the foundation of apartheid. Um, we would agree with that. We, we don't want to use that lightly, but even, I would say that even 
annexing Mali you know, one settlement, that would be the foundation because that is literally the, the breaking point here. So um, it's, one would think that they would go small first so as not to uh, invite, you know, so much backlash from the international community. Okay. So there is also a um, foundation for this uh, um, belief that Brian is uh, um, presenting uh, because I know of at least one uh, bill that was uh, that was written uh, by the right wing uh, uh, parliament members that offered to annex only Male Dumim, and mm. then there was this. A, a map that Netanyahu showed us uh, in which he um, uh, declared he was going to annex only uh, Jordan Valley. So it, it is, and, and then the, the Trump's deal was uh, uh, talking about the entire, the, all the settlements at once, but it does seem logical that they will try a pilot plan, show uh, that it uh, may be uh, uh, see, like test the water, and um, and then see what happens. Uh, it's it quite like it. Yeah, and I just want to add one thing. You know, we forgot to talk about Gantz here. You know, the idea of a national unity government with Gantz. The only thing he said outwardly so far was that he would support a limited annexation. He tried to, you know, he tried to downplay that he would actually be willing to. Uh, you know, forfeit his own stance against the annexation on this. Um, of course, we don't know what he actually thinks or what he'll actually do, but we have to be concerned. Um, but again, when he says limited annexation, that seems to lend credence to the idea that, you know, if the government was to move forward on annexation, it would try small at first. Right. So while we're talking about this, we're talking about this phased approach. Um, would you be able to comment on how the, and you mentioned the Israeli public has differing views on different elements of annexation. Could you comment on some of the more specifics of that? So what is the general Israeli public's view on annexation in general? And then what is their view on specific elements of annexation? Where does that land? And we know we have some questions from the audience, including E1, um, you know, a couple other specific locations. If there's any other specifics you could touch on, I think that would be uh, I want to share with you um, some insights we got from a researcher called the Professor Hirschberger from the from uh, the Academy IDC Academy in Herzliya in Israel. He led the research uh, a survey that uh, um, questioned people's positions regarding annexation and the um, first the clear the clear result was that most of Israelis uh, oppose annexation they don't see it as the favored um, future for Israel they 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 prefer a um, two-state solution one way or another or separation from between the Israelis and the Palestinians some would prefer call it but then when he goes to more detailed questions, uh, they actually reveal that most of people don't have a very well uh, uh, set um, opinion about the issue. They don't know enough. Mm. They might support annexation and to set solution at once without noticing that they, um, they, they uh, contradict, contradict each, each other. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and and people's positions are subject to political trends and to the identity of the leader that leads the way and more than than to actual details of the of the proposed plan uh, that's unfortunate but that's a situation that's why maybe we have to tackle the issue in a mo on a more emotional ideological basis and not on the rational, uh, detailed um, basis. Yeah, and, and I'll just say this, you know, it's, this is true of Israel as it is everywhere else. Until an issue becomes imminent in the truest sense of the word, people aren't going to become informed on the issue. So the big caveat to all these polls, if you call it 
applying sovereignty or annexation, you know, they don't matter quite as much until the day comes. It's, it's not that different, I guess, than, you know, polls before an election here where, you know, the last week counts a lot more. And that's where, you know, civil society and especially Peace Now come into play. We are there to inform the media um, and to inform allies in the Knesset uh, so that they can present uh, the, the challenges and the problems associated with annexation. Great. Um, we had an entire uh, webinar previously talking about the coronavirus. Um, and I'm sure, you know, it's the, it's the topic of every single discussion 24-7 uh, nowadays. Um, but I'm wondering if you might touch on, uh, we just talk about that a little bit, about how the, the coronavirus pandemic has affected the Israeli conflict, um, if any ways it's, that it's affected Israeli democracy. You want me to start? Okay. Uh, it has affected <laughs> Israeli democracy. As I described, it's, it's uh, shock doctrine at its best performance. We see uh, not only that there is not a clear cut um, result to the election, but also the prime minister is, was about to go to, to start his trial uh, in very serious charges of, how do you say it? Bribery? Uh, in fraud, yeah. Fraud. Yeah. Uh, and, and while the, the accusations of corruption used to be quite um, uh, serious, once the, the crisis has began, people are much more uh, focused on their uh, uh, individual uh, um, lives and matters. And once Netanyahu is in power position, he uses it in order to, uh, sh to, 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 to have um, TV performances as the national uh, leader that explains the situation. He even explained to us how we should wash our hands in order to avoid infection. It was very, uh, um, I'd say, um, um, even, even parental in a way to, to show all the, the people in Israel that he's here to protect us and uh, of course, that his trial was delayed in a couple of months because it's not possible to handle it while the crisis is going on and to open the court where it's supposed to to, to happen. And uh, and there were some other uh, uh, incidents of clear violation of the rules of democracy in Israel. For example, the speaker of the Knesset, which was nominated. Uh, three cadences ago, before the, the, the three elections ago, um, tried to prevent a re-election to, to, to his position. Once he understood that he lost the majority of the parliament, he didn't allow um, the, the plenary to have uh, voting over his position in order not to lose it, and he claimed that it can be done only after a government is formed. So they tried to, 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 to hold this other position, power, power position, uh, um, longer than they should have, and I'm talking about Likud party. And then, after an appeal was made to the Supreme Court about that, and the Supreme Court uh, forced him to, forced, I'm talking about Yuli Edelstein, the Speaker of the Council, forced him to, um, to to how do you say to to close to resign now to assemble the the plenary yeah to convene yeah the, uh, to convene he refused to do so so it was a a precedent where this such a high position in Israel only second to the president uh, just um, refuses to follow Supreme Court's order that's a, a huge. Uh, uh, a violation uh, of separation of powers in a way. Yes. Yeah. And then started a very um, intense, um, no, I don't know if very intense because we're in times of Corona, but quite intense um, protest, which was, which is still called the black flag protest. And people found very creative ways to um, demonstrate 
uh, uh, under the limitations uh, because of the virus, such as a rally of cars uh, on the road to, the, to, the, to Jerusalem and to the parliament with black flags. The police start, uh, tried to, to stop this rally and then they had to, um, to let them uh, continue. Uh, I was there, it was very powerful, uh, the power of the people uh, uh, demanding their rights. And until now, all the regulations that are published under the healthcare uh, um, uh, limitations uh, still include the rights to protest. So w even when we're not allowed to leave our homes for uh, uh, farther than uh, 100 meters, if we do it in, in order to protest, we're allowed to do so. So we did, as, as Peace Now, we did lead a protest in front of uh, Benny Gantz's house uh, and, we, and we brought the black flag people with us and the black flags and we called him to veto the annexation. Uh, and tonight there is a big rally in Rabin Square in Tel Aviv that we're going to go right after this webinar. Um, again, against the violation of the democratic game and uh, and attempts to uh, step upon the norms and, and let a, a prime minister uh, charged with corruption to continue and lead Israel. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from our audience. I, I think it kind of leads into what you were chatting about, um, Brian, as well with the, the separation of powers and the, the violation of this. Could you, could you tell our audience here about how an annexation may actually come about, um, either through force of government or legislation itself? Just kind of, if you could touch on that at all. Yeah, sure. So there's different types of annexation. That the traditional one that we think about, let's call it parliamentary annexation. You, you declare a law and then, uh, and then that annexation is implemented. It takes in order to annex Jerusalem, it took Israel about three years. So there's a difference, you know, there's a bit of a lag between when the law is passed and when it's implemented. Um, there's a second type of annexation, though, called legal or legalistic annexation. And that is applying Israeli administrative laws into the settlements uh, or to settlers um, without actually declaring, okay, this area is annexed. Um, and one bill on the table, um, like all the bills, they're sort of just languishing at the moment, is to, to straight up uh, dissolve uh, the civil administration, the military government that rules the West Bank. When you dissolve the, the civil administration, no longer is there one sort of military government that rules both Palestinians and um, governs uh, Israelis. Uh, and in that sense, there would be sort of two systems of law for two different peoples, but it's the same regime and it's the same territory. I mean, that's, that's what we would call legalistic annexation. Dissolving the, the civil administration, that's one way to do it. Another way is to pass laws one by one into the West Bank and have them only apply to Israelis. Um, and again, the, the difference between how that is now, of course, settlers who live in the West Bank have all the rights that other Israelis do, um, but, ultimately settlers are still beholden to the civil administration. If they want to build in settlements, they have to go through the defense ministry to, to approve new housing plans. That would be no longer once you apply this, you know, legalistic administrative annexation. Um, and in a way, it's sort of the, you know, it's the easiest way to pass annexation under the radar because it's a little more complicated to understand. Um, so for us, it's, for us, it's almost as important to, to focus on that as these parliamentary annexation attempts because, you know, if at the very least there, you know, people's eye is on the parliamentary annexation. Um, can you comment on the actual settlement construction? At yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that actually happening right now under the coronavirus lockdown? Or they, is that continuing? Is that on hold? What does that actually look like right now? And, and, you, and you asked the question in uh, the same question as the democracy, so sorry for not answering. Um, generally speaking, uh, settlements 
are continuing at the same pace as they were before the coronavirus. So um, the problem there, especially, is, is not that, um, you know, it, it sounds like nothing's happened. But in fact, if there's been all these restrictions and it's continuing at the same pace, that means that there's, it's, it's extra bad. It means that, you know, there are more efforts to continue settlement, um, not just construction, but settlement activity in general um, while coronavirus is going on. So there's, there were two new outposts. That's about, that's, that's pretty much on par with what we were predicting. Um, but it means they went ahead despite supposedly having to stay in their homes. There has been a rise in settler violence. Um, at the same time, uh, someone mentioned something about E1. Um, the tenders, uh, these are, um, you know, bids on large construction projects in the West Bank. Those are currently on hold, and there are some demolitions on hold. There are other demolitions that are not on hold. Palestinians have, have actually had to suffer. Um, you know, there, there is even a medical tent that was knocked down. Um, Palestinians can't uh, create uh, a temporary village outside of their own villages to quarantine themselves. These are, these are problems that will affect Palestinians, but of course will affect us as well, seeing as you know, the, the border is so porous. And, and of course, there are so many settlers in the West Bank that you know, anything, any sort of collapse of the PA health system will ultimately affect Israel. And even Naftali Bennett has, has acknowledged this. Um, so yes, generally, I, I don't want to go too much into it, but generally speaking, the settlement enterprise is continuing. The, the thing I think, the reason why we focus so much on annexation is because the coronavirus is a crisis. And a crisis is always an opportunity for people to exploit a situation to do things that they wouldn't uh, under normal circumstances. Okay. Um, I'd like to just shift the conversation, returning to something uh, regarding protest or activism um, under Corona lockdown. Um, and I want to shift this into a little bit of a Canadian lens. Um, one of the things that the Canadian Friends of Peace now does is the, the funding of the Emil Grunzweig Fellowship um, Award. I'm wondering if you might be able to comment on what that's looking like today, how those individuals or recipients or participants of that program are continuing to be able to do any of their work. Um, and if you could also comment on uh, the relationship between the Canadian organization and the Israeli organization, um, how you feel as though it's impacting you or benefiting or anything like that. I think our audience uh, would really like to hear that from you. So if there's anything you can say, I would really appreciate that. Can I? Sure. So yes, uh, we are facing a challenge uh, in, Activism in times of Corona uh, makes us uh, be more creative than ever. Um, the Hirschberger uh, webinar that I've mentioned was actually hosted by the Emil Greenzweig Fellows uh, uh, in cooperation between three campuses um, that where, where, where they are active and they invited students to uh, participate in that webinar. Uh, via Zoom like we're having right now. Uh, their next plan is uh, something we haven't done before and we're quite enthusiastic to, to try, is a virtual tour because they had to cancel a tour to the West Bank with our segment watch um, uh, coordinator and uh, it was canceled and we, they tried to, 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 to change it into a virtual tour in which people can be at their homes and, uh, and see the, um, the sites of the West Bank and, uh, um, and the, the, the actual tour, the explanations and the experience of a, I must tell you that this is one of the, I think the best ways to, to get our ideas uh, uh, to the people is when we managed to take them over to the West Bank to see for themselves. And if we crack this uh, um, barrier of actually taking them there and succeed in showing them this reality uh, through their uh, computer screens, then we might even uh, succeed later on in bringing this message to uh, wider audiences. Mm -hmm. So we might even uh, benefit in the long term 
from these challenges that the coronavirus poses to us. Anything else? Yeah, um, well, I would say just on, on the larger scale, um, the coronavirus has, it's, it's allowed us to sort of do things that we've put on the back burner. So again, the, the virtual tour, other webinars, these are things we can document and we can bring to more people. And by the way, way more people actually not just sign up, but actually will join these Zoom uh, webinars that we do than, than what we could bring on tours. You know, there's a limited capacity. Um, and just to echo the, the idea of the Emil Grunzweig Fellowship, I mean, really, Canadian Friends for Peace Now uh, is, is the, the sole uh, benefactor of our university program. Our university um, presence is, is, is thanks to you guys. Um, and given the fact that for any movement, you need young, you need young new, new, uh, you know, new recruits, especially people who can actually, you know, give their time for activism. Um, it's one of the most important aspects of our entire movement to have these young contingents um, there to be able to, to form these clubs and to, um, and to reach their, their peers, which we can't ourselves. I'd even, I'd even uh, uh, say that uh -huh. we're actually building the next generation of the peace camp. And this next generation might bring change of ideas, might bring new spirits, might have its own ways to, to, to uh, make an impact. And it's very important that we're there to, um, to, to sow the seeds of, of belief in, 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 in this uh, two-state solution future and to give the tools for the younger uh, generation uh, to, to be able to lead the camp in a few years. And our presence in the universities when they are active is very uh, well, um, uh, uh, it, 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 it has an, a, a very um, visible effect. For example, uh, in last uh, November, I think, no, even, even January, before the elections, there was a big event that uh, Ben Gurion University in, the, in Be'er Sheva organized about um, uh, different sorts of solutions to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And of course, uh, our chapter of Peace Now led the two-state solution uh, vision. Um, and the entire uh, idea to have this topic as the main topic of their only political day before the elections was led by our activists uh, that were educated in our uh, um, uh, uh, um, programs and therefore I, I, I can really see the results of uh, what we're doing in um, in changing the, the agenda of the younger generation. I mean I, I really I really appreciate that um, particularly in these times everybody wants to feel connected you know Canadians Canadians want to feel as though they're connected to your organization and, and to Israel and um, and especially during coronavirus lockdown, people in general are wanting to feel more connected. I think that for all of us, um, despite the horrible scenario that is the coronavirus and the amount of deaths that have been occurring, one of the major possible positive outcomes that are gonna come out of this is perhaps even an increase in connectedness. And Brian, I mean, you touched on that where you know, maybe only 10 people show up to an actual live uh, event where they're going into the West Bank to see what's going on. Via this technology, you can actually reach out to hundreds or thousands of people at once who, who otherwise wouldn't have been able to do that. And one of my personal suspicions is that following, you know, the actual opening up at once the coronavirus starts to slow down is that we will have gotten into some really good habits of finding better opportunities to connect with each other. You know, our organization speaking to each other, Canadians speaking to Israelis, connecting in large groups, having these bigger conversations. Um, and uh, I can just say, I feel like this opportunity right now is just a really good example of that. Do you guys have any thoughts that are similar to that? Or do you have anything that's contradictory? I mean, what do you, how do you guys feel about that? 
I must say I was really excited a few days ago when I discovered that the Canadian Friends of Peace now signed a letter aimed that uh, Benny Gantz and his partners in Blue and White and, and Tomir Paris, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and, and shared um, the international Jewish community's efforts to, to um, stop annexation and to uh, pressure those leaders to veto it. And uh, for me, knowing as an Israeli, knowing that people around the world take a moment away from the corona crisis and, and look at us and take care of uh, Israel's future, uh, it seems to me like it, it was very empowering, very um, uh, exciting, and I was very proud to share it and to talk about it in Israel because sometimes they say to us, when you talk about annexation in times of corona, it means that you are um, uh, disconnected from the, the reality in Israel because everybody is concerned about their uh, uh, physical situation or economical situation, how come you talk, still talk about your peace ideas? And then I say, hey, there are, there are lots of people around the world that take the time from their own crisis and they pay attention to this so important issue. So it brings us a, a much more solid base to, to, to fight on. So thank you for that. Yeah, no, no, but by all means, uh... I just want to emphasize, you know, Benny Gantz, uh, Gabi Ashkenazi, these are new politicians. They're more impressionable than old politicians who already have a bunch of interests thrown at them. Of course, Amir Peretz, the head of the Labor Party, you know, he's head of a left-wing party. These are all people that, that can actually be swayed by uh, certain comments from the international community, especially the diaspora Jewish community. And in addition to that, um, it, it should be said, of course, that um, you know, in a way, we, we do rely on CFPN and on uh, other sister organizations in different countries to, to bring to their own governments the fact that there is a, there is a nuanced way to be pro-Israel um, that, that takes into account the fact that for there to be a, a secure Jewish and democratic state for the future, you need to have uh, a Palestinian state. It's, if you don't it just means that this conflict is going to be prolonged. And the other fantasies of how to resolve a conflict without a two-state solution, they fail every, every test. They fail to, to appreciate the democratic principle and the ability to uh, create stability in this region. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, and I think that, I think that helps us transition uh, into another question here is that, let's say, Worst case scenario, this actually goes ahead. Annexation starts occurring, perhaps in piecemeal or perhaps wholesale, wholesale annexation. What happens in the international community if this actually occurs? If, if partly or an entire annexation happens, how does the rest of the world view this? How do they change? How do they respond? Um, and then on top of that, is Israel even concerned about that? You know, what does Benjamin Netanyahu or Benny Gantz, what do they think about potential changes in response from the international community should annexation actually occur? Uh, why don't I start with the international part and I'll hand it over to Shaked. Um, of course, we don't, we can't speak for what, what foreign delegations are saying. Um, I'll say this presently when there's been uh, some particularly sensitive settlement moves like um, attempts to expand E1, there has been EU pressure, um, but it, and it was something, I don't want to downplay it, but it, it could have been more. Um, and it sort of it left us with the impression once again that really changes, it's really only going to happen from the inside as long as, especially as long as, as Trump is the US president. Um, if annexation was to happen, you know, supposedly there would be more international backlash. And it's not something we look forward to as, as Israelis or as someone like me who's, you know, I grew up in the U.S. before I moved to Israel. I, I don't like the idea of, you know, international backlash, but um, it is something that, that Israel should, of course, be concerned with because, you know, it, it would violate every agreement and, and consensus that they've had with all of their partners. Um, 
now, now certainly if annexation was to happen after, you know, if the Trump presidency was terminated, if there was a new president, I, I'm really not sure that we would be having the same discussion. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I would not invest, I would not invest too much into thinking that the international community can somehow save Israel by, by putting on the pressure. Okay. Um, and so we, we have the, the, the other element of that question is, is that something that, that you guys believe is actually on the minds of our political leaders today? Um, it, it, well, it is to a degree. The EU did uh, um, send a message to Gantz. They are speaking with them. And again, it's not that EU pressure doesn't matter. It matters a great deal. It just means it can't do the job in of itself. You know, friends of Israel can't push Israel to do, and it sh you know, that shouldn't be the case. It should ultimately come from, from the people. Um, but the, the worry here is that with, with Trump in power, there's, there's, you know, if we're looking at like the scales, he's, he's, you know, putting his thumb on the scale so much that there is a worry that, you know, even Gantz himself, seeing as he is, he does seem to be a bit weak in standing his ground, uh, might be swayed to, you know, some sort of quote unquote compromise annexation that's a small annexation, which as I mentioned is, is a, you know, a watershed moment. It's, it's not, a, you know, a compromise. It's, it's giving in to the ideological right that, you know, only a few years ago, these were fantasy plans that, you know, no one thought would actually happen. Okay. Um, so I think that leads us into a, a question about our organization specifically. So the raison d'etre, right? The reason to exist of peace now is one of the main reasons is the establishment of peace and a two-state solution, okay? This is, this is certainly what many people believe is the raison d'etre of the organization. Should annexation occur? And let's say even a wholesale annexation, what happens to Peace Now's purpose? How, you know, it, will there be a transition? Will there be a shift? What does the work look like? Um, and if, if that kind of annexation occurs, and we'll be talking about the international community, what will be your stance on that? And what would you hope would be the stance of your sister organizations around the world on that new reality? So I know that's a very loaded question. That's a big question. It is, it is, it's a question that we keep asking ourselves. I'll try to look at it from, from two different perspectives. One perspective is to say that annexation doesn't happen in one day. We're, we've been talking about creeping annexation for a while. Annexation is already happening and we're still not closing this now. Every new settlement or illegal outpost is another vehicle to implement annexation. Every road paved, every tender for a new settlement, it's annexation de, de facto. The, legal, the legalistic annexation that Brian talked about uh, is also happening. Or, I mean, the fact that there will be one legislative step that will, uh, uh, I'd say, formally cement the idea of annexation, might not be the most, I mean, I don't want to downgrade it, but uh, uh, it's, it, it will be maybe more, <laughs> more reversible than some of the, um, of the construction plans that we're fighting against. Mm. Uh, so in a way, I don't see, um, I don't think that there is a one point where annexation uh, uh, happens and then our, uh, uh, we have to, 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 to to close uh, the peace organizations and go home and, and say, okay. I mean, uh, even if the next day we're gonna fight for uh, um, against the apartheid state that might derive from an annexation, uh, a formal annexation, we will still be suggesting the alternative, which is, is gonna be still the two-state solution because we don't know of any other way to uh, maintain Israel's character as a Jewish and democratic state and uh, uh, letting the Palestinians live uh, next to us. Um, so I don't see peace now 
changing it, its agenda very much. And I think we've been facing these challenges for a while now. And something else, another perspective I want you to have is that so far, annexation hasn't stopped the, the, the peace camp from uh, pushing forward its ideas. Uh, even the annexation of East Jerusalem hasn't stopped us from uh, demanding two, two capitals in Jerusalem. And the annexation of the Golan Heights didn't stop us from uh, um, supporting negotiations with Syria when it was possible. I mean, it's, it's, it's less, it's not as easy, but you can negotiate over uh, um, annexed territories as well. And uh, as long as the step is unilateral, and I guess that the international community, apart from the USA, will not um, endorse it, or or even uh, um, uh, how do you say allow. that? Allow. Not allow, like um, condone. Like uh, uh, um, see it as a fact. <laughs> um, so we can still uh, uh, say it's controversial and, and, uh, and continue our fight over it while once peace agreement is signed, it is much less reversible if, 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 uh, if I mean, it's not reversible. The peace agreement that Israel has signed were a one-way direction. Once we signed with Egypt, that's it. There is no more war and conflict with Egypt. We have a, a, a border there. And once we've signed with Jordan, that's it. And it's very uh, hard to, to, to go back from the achievements of the, of the left wing in Israel. So I try to, to claim to say here that it, even if the right wing has an achievement, we still have to see it as something we need to fight on and change, uh, because once we achieve our goals, they will be irreversible, and they, they will be constant and, and uh, long-lasting. Yeah, in, in terms of what, what sister organizations can do, um, yeah, just to piggyback off of that, yeah, again, the raison d'etre of, of uh, peace now is not the two-state solution, it is a conflict-ending agreement and preferably one that are on good terms for Israel. Uh, a, a, the conflict is going to end, you know, it's just, will it end on the terms we like, or will it end on terms where, you know, Israel is having to make a desperate, unstable move here or there. So um, I just want to emphasize, we are not there yet where the two-state solution is dead and irredeemably dead. As Shaked mentioned, there's, it takes time to actually implement annexation. Um, and even then, even after it's implemented, it can be reversed. Um, but, but let's say that the two-state solution paradigm is completely gone. Yeah, we're not going to close shop. We're going to adapt to a new paradigm. And the role of the sister organizations um, is to have that, that conversation on what that new paradigm will be, and then for us to all uh, coordinate on that new paradigm. I mean, I, I, I really appreciate you elucidating what, that, what that's actually going to look like. I think a lot of our membership is asking themselves that same question, right? Should the reality on the ground shift, how should we even think about this? How, you know, what should our next actions be? You know, we have some questions from our audience here which are asking similar questions. If we essentially move into a one-state solution as a result of a right-wing policy, what is the left-wing response to that? Will there be... Um, people asking for a true one state, secular democratic state uh, with full citizenship for all. Is that something that Peace Now would advocate for? You know, historically we have advocated for two states for two peoples. What, what is, where does that opinion stand within your arsenal? Uh, okay, I, that's, that's a, it's a very interesting question. It's also a very big conjecture. Right. Most likely, the issue with the, the single democratic state idea, the idea that there's no, there's, it's actually not a binational state. That the, the idea is that it's just one person, one vote. It's a, sort of a liberal state where you, it's all individual based. Um, it's not the multicultural state that you would see with Canada. Um, I don't think most of the Jewish polity would, would ever accept something like that. Probably the closest thing 
to what could actually work is some sort of confederation approach. By all means, we love to read about it because this is our line of work. We want to hear other options. But the, the reason why we continue to, to cling to the two-state solution is not only because it still has all the support of the international community, um, but it is, it's, it's easier to do at this point than a confederation, which still, by the way, you look at even the no, best, the I best point. that the confederation is, is somehow a two-state solution. They're talking about one state, which is not a confederation, it's a one state. They, okay, the, the confederationists love to call it, say it's a two-state solution because that's their selling point. But the fact is that if it's a single border and it's a single country, it's, it's still on the international level, it's, I mean, it's, it's like calling England and Scotland two different countries. Yes, they're defined as two different countries, but at the end of the day, it's a single state on the international system. The problem is you look at the Confederation and you see that they still have to deal with borders. It's actually still in land for all. Um, you still have to deal with a, a myriad of issues. I'm, I would be thrilled if they could solve it, if they could address the security needs a lot more. Um, but yeah, in my, my guess, it's not like we, we talk about this, you know, will we go for confederation or single democratic state? My guess is we're going to go with the thing that is most palpable to Israelis um, and that also uh, ends the occupation in a just manner that allows for, for both justice and stability for both Israelis and Palestinians. And that's probably more towards a confederation than the, the liberal single democratic state. Okay. I must add, I must add that peace now, as you know, is a Zionist movement. As such, we believe that there is a, a, a fundamental need for a home, a national home for the Jewish people. Uh, so if we lose that, we lose uh, our, our, our vision in, um, and the, the whole raison d'etre of the state of Israel. So we share uh, uh, the same uh, interest, uh, like we, we see ourselves as a, an Israeli, pro-Israeli patriotic movement that, um, that wants what is best for Israel as a Zionistic uh, um, movement. And um, I must say that a uh, uh, one-man, one-vote uh, liberal democratic state might be in theory, a good idea. I'm not sure it is. Um, it it can exist in the Middle East, and I'm not sure that it is uh, what we've dreamed of when we when 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 my grandfathers fought for the um, for the uh, state of Israel. Um, so uh, the two state solution in is is not only the most feasible solution but it's also the more uh, pro israel solution excellent well thank you both Shikhan and brian for uh, kind of illustrating how um the importance of both the jewish and democratic character of the of the of the mission is, is really kind of integral to everything in the organization um I think that why don't we end uh, today's discussion on how we move forward. So there was some discussion earlier regarding the signing of, uh, of some letters that went out from the diaspora. How do you feel that Canada or the United States, uh, that the Americans for Peace Now or Canadians for Peace Now or Brits for Peace Now or France for Peace Now, how, how best can we actually continue to operate here? What would you like to see from Canadians? What would you like to see from you know, Canadian Friends of Peace now? Um, how can we best uh, impact the movement in a, in a positive way, whether that's in today's current environment where annexation hasn't occurred or in a potential future environment where it has? You know, what would you like to see from us moving forward? Um, so I'll, I'll say this, the, the biggest challenge we have at the moment is being able to inform as many Israelis as possible, to inform and to persuade. Um, the best way that our sister organizations like CFPN uh, can support us is by helping us inform and persuade the Israeli public. And that really has to deal with uh, funding our activities to do so. That includes um, our, our media activities, that includes uh, echoing our social media uh, messaging, but also, you know, supporting, we, you know, it, it, it costs money to project 
different messages to have, we have videos sometimes that are high production value. Um, it also includes uh, our work in Settlement Watch, which monitors settlements and brings the, the costs of occupation and settlements to the Israeli people. Um, so there's a lot of costs that go into that, everything from aerial surveys to petitions, to everything in, in general, um, the more support we get financially, as well as echoing our messages online and in the media, the more we are going to be able to reach the Israeli public, as well as friends of Israel who, at the end of the day, are a stakeholder in this conflict and have a, a, real, uh, a real ability to sway opinions here in Israel, especially the, the Jewish diaspora community. Um, and uh, I would encourage you, if, if you'd like, of course, sign up to CFPN's emails. Um, the newsletters that go out often uh, summarize a lot of the information we bring out, both in Settlement Watch and what we're doing on the ground with, with youth and in the streets. But you can also sign up. It's, you just go to peacenow.org.il slash ing. And um, just the Peace Now website, you can sign up and you can also directly s receive our newsletters um, for all of those things. Uh, if I may add, as I visited um, the CFPN branches in, ca in Canada twice uh, in the past year, uh, I want to uh, also greet you for the, the, the um, internal activity that you have in order to uh, spread the idea of the two-state solution and the need for uh, peace uh, in Israel. And, and the very basic um, uh, uh, notion that being pro-two-state solution is actually being pro-Israel. Mm -hmm. In times when uh, Trump uh, uh, brings the deal of the century uh, to Israel as sort of a, a present from the American um, uh, um, president uh, to the Israelis, here I give you the right to annex the territories and, and get, get this wonderful gift. It's also important that we hear Israelis, we hear the voice that say, this is not a gift, this is a, a hazard to the Israeli democracy, to Israel's security, to the chances for a future peace agreement. This is something that is against Israel and not pro-Israel and in order to uh, have these voices heard it's important that we uh, have uh, allies like uh, Canadian Friends of Peace now that know uh, the, the, the baselines of the agenda and, uh, and can uh, spread the word so thank you for that too. Excellent um, okay so I think that brings us to the end of uh, today's discussion um, so thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you to a lot of people. I want to say thank you to the administrators who helped put uh, today's session together. I want to say thank you to all of our guests and attendees uh, who joined us today, everybody who sent in a question in advance, the questions that have come live on chat. Uh, for anybody following the chat, it's an extremely spirited discussion that's happening right now, you know, debate and discussion. What I love about this is that uh, we're always open to debate. We want to hear differences, different kinds of opinions. We want to discuss these things openly. Um, we're, our, our organizations are very in favor of dialogue. Uh, and then finally, of course, I want to thank the two of you very much, uh, both Brian and Shaked. Um, we're all really busy, and particularly the two of you. And uh, making the time to come and spend this time and connect with Canadians and anybody else who may be joining this webinar from around the world, whether it's in Europe or Israel itself, um, or anywhere else. Uh, we really appreciate you spending that time coming and connecting with all of us and building that personal relationship. It's, it's really important. And so I can't stress enough um, just really how much gratitude uh, myself and the rest of the organization have for you in, in offering your time with us today. Well, thank you, Josh. And uh, we just want to say thanks again to Canadian Friends for Peace Now. Um, it's, it's really been a pleasure working with you as a partner and your your support for us is invaluable. Excellent. Okay, well, I mean, thank you very much. I mean, any other closing comments? Take care. Okay. Don't get infected with COVID-19, we need you. Okay. Well, well, thanks, Brian, thank you, Shaket. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you all again soon. Thank you. Take care.
拜拜。Bye bye. Bye.